Hey, everybody. I hope this is actually coming through. Uh, this is a very rare moment where the Crafty Partners appear on camera. Uh, we don't normally do this sort of thing. We're troglodytes and hide in caves and deliver all of our things um, uh, late at night where pe when people cannot see us. Um, I am here with game designer Sean Stankiewicz, who... Uh, is one third of the trio of Flat Out Games, uh, who made Dollars to Donuts. Um, Dylan Mangini, uh, the illustrator and graphic designer who has made everything pretty and uh, made all of us look good. And Alex Flagg, who shows up every once in a while uh, so that we can get a whiff of his quaff of beautiful long COVID hair. That's very serious. Although not right quite now. as long as Sean's these days. <laughs> and here we are he's uh, joining us from space today so uh, made well, well you know it's more the lab i've got the robots of doom over here uh you know the uh hearts of my enemies out of ca uh, camera but uh you know <clears throat> <laughs> i did other find something else too i thought this was a fun artifact so uh, I don't know if we can see this or if the background blocks it. Oh, yes. Okay, so it has to be over my face. Uh, ooh. Uh, okay, so yeah, uh, I found the very first prototype of Dollars to Donuts that I got from Sean many, oh, many wow. moons ago. The, this is like the original Founders that Edition, done, isn't yeah. it? That's the Super Founders Edition. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> All hand cut. Pretty awesome. This is what I've been playtesting with, actually. So, yeah, like... Can't. Yeah, the original tiles, all that other with, stuff. So. Yeah, with the teeny tiles before we made them jumbofied. This is a mighty good looking prototype, but the final version is better, Dylan. Sorry, Sean. Thanks. No worries. <laughs> I, I'm still, I marvel at how pretty our uh, Founders Editions are. Um, and that, watching that video of Sean putting them together, my God. <laughs> <laughs> It's like you got to put your architecture school skills to work every once in a while. People <laughs> still think I'm crazy for doing the old uh, Ulfa blade and straight edge cutting method. Uh, st still use that quite a bit. Um, I do have like a slide cutter as well, but I find the blade and straight edge is like sometimes faster for certain things and also for cutting like thicker stuff like tiles. Like you kind of need that technique anyways. So, yeah. How are your wrists not destroyed? <laughs> I guess I have tough wrists from all the <laughs> good all that time probably. of cutting stuff. Well, it does get pretty like I had to do those in in waves. I think for the Dollar to Donuts, we did uh, ten ten Founders editions, and so I think I did them at like two or three at a time. Um, but I will say, like cutting other game, like hex tiles are way worse than mm -hmm. the kind of straight tiles. And for like our other game, Public Market, where it has polyomino tiles, those are a huge pain to cut. <laughs> so right. There's the inside so, corners. Did you do, were you like, you know, efficient when you're making your PMP, where you put all the polyomino, uh, polyominoes together really closely so you couldn't make any straight like cuts out to the edge? That's the thing is I've started to, like, when I do strange things on uh, punch boards anymore, I'll just <laughs> make them so there's like one per sheet so I can be super sloppy and I can take big <laughs> slashing cuts because otherwise it's just forever to cut out every little Yeah, uh, sadly I did like put them together like Tetris. And so that was, it was efficient in terms of materials, but it wasn't the fastest way to cut them. But yeah. I remember discovering like the the way that you have to lay out hexes like the hard way you know where you've got like the tri like triangles between all of them so you can just do like three long cuts across the whole sheet the first couple times i threw it together it's it wasn't like that and it was a huge pain obviously so live and learn how many uh cascadia pro uh prototypes have you had to make now <laughs> Well, lots of prototypes. We also have a Founders Edition for that, and uh, that has like 20 copies so far. Oh, wow. So, yeah, I had to cut a few of those. And then we did like 10 for Calico. Uh, but Cascadia, we had tons of iterations kind of along the way, too. Dylan's also working on that. So, we've been making changes to tiles and all that kind of stuff. It, it looks fantastic. The, it all does. the art, it, 
the I saw the I think Randy posted the new um, cards and stuff, and Beth's art is stellar. So it looks really really good. Yeah, we're gonna do Cascadia proud and show off all the beautiful landscapes and animals. So yeah. it's pretty exciting. Have you chosen a launch date for that one? Uh, nothing solid just yet. We're we're still lining things up, but it'll be in September sometime. Cool. Right on. Yeah. I look forward to it. Hey guys, so Very cool. uh, your uh, French translator Alan is uh, in the stream. He's just saying hello. So if you guys yeah, say bonjour to What's Alan. Bonjour, bonjour, Alan. What time uh, is it? In I think I owe you France. an email. I apologize. I've been so busy. I haven't had a chance to get back to translators today or yesterday. So Dylan asked what time it was in France. Yeah. I mean, what are you looking at? GMT plus one, something like that. Yeah, I think it's so. about 2 a.m. there right now. Whew. Yeah, 2 a.m. <laughs> that's that's yeah, commitment. <laughs> well, he was the first translator to turn in materials. Um, and uh, he's in Quebec, we... so it's only 8 p.m. Uh, oh, okay. And when we first started the translation project, I expected that I would just be sitting on a pile of of, uh, of word files and begging Dylan to help. <laughs> and uh, um, Alan actually did layout on it. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, so we have laid out French translations, Spanish ones too. Um, some people don't have the facilities to make the, um, that are helping us, don't have the facilities to make the, uh, the layout. So in those cases, I probably will be begging you, Dylan. But, <laughs> <laughs> but in all the other cases, it's wonderful. We're getting back uh, pretty translated documents. Thanks. So. That's awesome. Yeah. Up to six languages now, although we may actually be a little higher. Uh, I think we might have gotten a new language today. But <laughs> like, What day is it? What language do we have now? Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, it is really nice to have uh, have that side of things going so well. Less than a hundred dollars to uh, to forty k. Okay. Fifty two so, minutes. Uh, I feel like we're in a telethon now. Like, <laughs> got one hundred dollars to go. Our next goal here. Yeah. Need to get you one one of those old phones. That's right. Like an old rotary phone or something. Yeah, I could just be the guy in the background phone banking, just talking furiously <laughs> into an empty line, like. Look how serious I am. I mean, get those robots to work behind you. I don't know what That's you're right. doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> I do listen to a lot of NPR, so I would be the type that should be begging every other month for people's donations. <laughs> I've heard every single pitch they've got. So who has cool anecdotes about this game? Or donuts? Or both? You only used a limited number of my donut facts I dug up. Yeah, I tr so I tried. I had this big pile of donut facts uh, that Alex had given me, and I, I worked a few of them into updates, but it felt like they were some of the updates were getting crazy because I blather on, um, and we had so much content. Um, and so today, earlier today, I tried posting one of your gifts to see if anyone would bite, and we, we could do the whole name the movie thing. Nothing. That was the <laughs> the single best one though was the Al Pacino one. Have you with, seen a with, movie with called the, Jack uh, and Jill before? Uh, so yeah, it's, that's it's, the one it's, I posted Al, earlier. Today. It's 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 Al Pacino's Cappuccino, and so it's him, and he does this whole song and dance bit like it's a Dunkin' Donuts thing, and like he he's doing lines, but they're all coffee and donut themed, and then like he rips open his jacket and he's got the liner of it is done in donuts and the vest is done in donuts and he's doing a whole like hollywood <laughs> song and dance number it's really really funny it's totally random it, um, it was pretty phenomenal bizarre. yeah i think i actually flummoxed people because i said don't use google tell me what movie this is and i think i probably the people who are paying attention were just scratching their head <laughs> <laughs> uh, i'm used to that but it was pretty cool So did uh, did Truffle Shuffle drop at uh, Gen Con online? It didn't actually. It's coming out on the twenty eighth, so it's coming soon. So yeah. continuing that trend of designing games about food because we do like our 
food at Flat Out Games. <laughs> food in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> I'm going to wedge those two things into every game we make. Truffles, donuts, seafood. You need to make I mean, a poutine game. Well, I mean, poutine, technically, yeah. you could say, in Cascadia, you could say, well, venison and salmon, right? Yep, we got salmon. But, yeah. but, you know, we're creating habitats, so these... These are steaks and waiting, you know. But <laughs> steaks and waiting. <laughs> yeah. uh, we didn't go with that for marketing, actually. Oh, Sean, no. I, <laughs> Sean, I have actually a very interesting story for you. Do you remember a, a convention called Godicon that was in Victoria? Uh, I remember there was one in Victoria, but I didn't. Maybe that was, is, was it recently, like in the last few it, years? It shut down in 2014 or 2015 was the last one. Oh, yeah, yeah so okay. Alex and I went up there, and um, they had a poutine truck. And the guy there loved Star Wars. And so I got the Darth Vader, the, the basically the Star Wars cosplayers to surf poutine out of his truck. And there was one dressed like a Jawa. And so every time she would hand somebody their food, she would say, poutine <laughs> <laughs> that show was great it was done uh in a uh god it was the searle center i think it was the so the hockey rink um up north of town mm. and yeah it was just it was so laid back and fun you know and you have all the the hockey players coming through and like looking like the hell because there's a bunch of nerds on the other on the tennis courts basically and then they they got um kind of adopted by uh, the local video game scene and uh, who wanted to like, you know, make it panels and video game focused. And so they ended up moving down to the Empress. It was quite a, <laughs> quite an upgrade for everybody, but got to try Redfish, Bluefish before, or before they shut down. So is that the show that used to be down in San Francisco and moved? No, uh, that's, you think of a Dundra? No, there was a show that started with G, and I could have sworn it was Gatacon, that I have really fond memories of. Um, well, there, there was Genghis Khan, but that was in Colorado. No, yeah, it wasn't Genghis Khan. Uh, Gatacon was local, local Canadian guys that just did it in their free time until it was taking so much time they couldn't manage it anymore. Mm. I miss those Bay Area shows, actually. Um, there were... Uh, uh, we, we did quite a few years at uh, KublaCon and, um, and DundraCon. They were good. I like those shows a lot. Did you manage to get out to them, Sean, at any point before everything went? No, I, I had wanted to go to like San Jose Protospiel. That's on my list. Um, but yeah, I haven't done any of the Bay Area stuff. Um, we, um, we kind of, in 2018 was our big like convention year where we went to Gen Con, Origins, BGG Con, PAX Unplugged, um, kind of all the big major ones. We just went on like a pitching spree and tried to like get out there and we had a bunch of games in tow. So it was like time to hit the convention circuit. Um, and that was a lot of fun. I mean, I kind of, it's been really rough not having conventions because just so many friends made over the course of a couple of years just going to conventions and stuff. And, you know, it's nice to keep in touch on Twitter and do a little bit of tabletop simulator, but it doesn't compare to just being able to take a few days and just goof around and play games and go for dinner and hang out. And it's, I miss that social interaction a lot. It's going to be yeah. weird not having BGG this year for sure. I know that you guys never really left the prototype room. <laughs> you <were laughs> always seem to be in there working. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I like last year's show was really good, I thought. Like, not having to get in there at 8 in the morning on Saturday so you could get a place to sit uh, was nice. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of surreal this year. It's like a whole year is an asterisk, you know. Yeah. Plus there's that New York deli with those amazing sandwiches right by the venue this past year. I've been thinking yeah. about that sandwich like all year. <laughs> like every, every show has that. It's like almost subdefined by food. Um, okay. There's that uh, that place that Ed and I found that does um, uh, those ice cream um, crepes. Remember those, Ed? Kill me. <laughs> <laughs> 
in uh, in Philadelphia. Oh man. <laughs> That's why I'm pissed. I want to go back to PAX Unplugged. And that well, indie. Man, oh my the, god. The weird thing is not being an indie. I've been going to Gen Con since 2002. Never missed. So it's like the 19th year I would have gone in a row. Uh, it's kind of surreal. But uh, yeah. well, you know, it doesn't change very much. <laughs> That's the, the thing. Is Indianapolis will be Indianapolis the next year. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I do miss um, hanging out with everybody. I miss playing games. Um, I don't miss coming home from the show smashed and voiceless. So uh, so there's that. Yeah. I'm always exhausted afterwards because natural introvert. So mm-hmm. that, we, mo- that many people. <laughs> we used to be able to have fun at conventions and, you know, pitch games and just play prototypes with our friends. But, you know. The last uh, PAX U, I guess, was the last convent, last convention we really worked. Well, I guess we were at uh, Dice Tower West. Dylan actually had a booth. We kind of split a booth there. Um, Dylan was selling tabletop, and we were promoting Cascadia. And uh, but yeah, like now, now conventions are definitely working conventions for flat out games for the most part. And uh, we had booths lined up for Origins and Gen Con this year. Uh, so we'll probably continue that in the coming years but yeah it's a uh, it's a bit of a transition it's pretty exhausting but it's a lot of fun because you gotta get to meet probably even more people that way um and hang out so it's good yeah i, I still um remember the very first gaming convention that i went to out of state um that was uh not done for work um and it was gen con 1998 <laughs> out of state every single convention i've done since has been work <laughs> sure. i have a local show i do every once in a while um i like that one uh i do that one just for fun but yeah and it was only not for work because ag took me and didn't have anything for me to do because i was hired like a week before um so i was still the guy who didn't have an assignment at the um at the company and so and i didn't know how to demo anything uh, and so they, they took me in for reasons that still mystify me. And then I got out there and I'm like, what should I do? And they're like, go explore, have fun. So I did. <laughs> we're $20 away from 40 grand. Yes, we are. Yes. So you do. All right. Who's going to be the backer that pushes us over? We get That's an excellent that? question. Yeah. That yeah. is an extra $20. Yeah. Um, Ed will be able to tell us once we, uh, yeah. Once we hit that that point, uh, Dylan, what shows do you do every year? Um, I mean, the only ones I go to every year are the more local ones. Like, uh, I mean, PAX PAX West isn't really a board game convention. Obviously, it's mostly video games, but mm-hmm. their board game area gets bigger every year. And like the last, I think the last two years, they had their own like building, like in a different hotel. So it almost felt like a mini mini convention um and then if you wanted to go check out the like more flashy displays in the in the video game area you could always do that but um yeah consistently i mean i, I go to a lot of the smaller ones like OrcaCon, um mm-hmm. as like a play or a play tester and as a game designer just to <clears throat> meet up with the rest of the seattle game design crew and Th- those feel almost just like a bigger meetup, you know. <laughs> Before the pandemic, we would meet up pretty much every Wednesday, um, and so a lot of those conventions are just like, all right, well now there's like 30 of us all in one room, and we can we can just be there all day, you know. Yeah. Without, right. without being in the in the lobby of someone's apartment, you know, like <laughs> there's a bit more space for everyone. So, the all right, so guys, uh, Jonathan like, could could. Vanna just pushed us over the forty thousand dollar mark. Jonathan. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Respect. We did it. I was getting nervous early in the week. I was like, I think we can make forty. I think we can do it. That's uh, that's all the customers, right? Oh no, there's one more set of customers, right? Yeah. Uh, Apparently, and it's us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so Pat, why don't you why don't you address that on the stream, Pat? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the last stretch goal um, 
doesn't clear till 44, which we obviously aren't going to make in 39 minutes. Um, but that's okay because we're going to be taking all the pledge manager funds except for shipping and applying it to that goal. So I'm positive we'll cross that line. Oh, awesome. So it won't be an issue. Because so. we got a, we still have a huge number of people that are on the remind me list, right? Uh, well, yes, but those reminders went out like, what is it, 43 hours ago? <laughs> 47 <laughs> hours and... <laughs> 21 minutes ago or whatever yeah so now actually i think i mentioned this kickstarter is actually emailing people multiple times if they don't back in that last few days um like if you sit hit remind me but you don't immediately back when the first reminder comes in you're actually seeing multiple reminders over the course of the the 72 hours yeah they also had a problem with their emails some people weren't getting them uh ascension tactics we had the same problem so oh really yeah I didn't know that. Okay, I remember the night cage had that where I got hit with I know, 10 emails and I figured like, oh, Smirk and Dagger isn't doing this. I'm just getting right. hammered. The reminders. <clears throat> Marvel says hi. Oh, <laughs> I was like, is this a backer? <laughs> sort of. Hello. Emotional Super support backer. cat. Now, Pat, is this, she looks is much this better me? at the beginning of summer because she's shaved down. What's that? And uh, is this the cat that eats the wires or the dumb this one? This is the cat that eats the wires. Yeah, she's uh, got pica. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you always know where to find her down underneath the computer. <laughs> well, she can't get to anything now because we've got all this elaborate piping and boxing around uh, around our cabling uh, to protect it. Um, so that's not a problem, but she still wanders around your feet for attention. So, do you guys remember back in 2011? I did that tour where I drove around the U.S. for two and a half months. I remember that. <laughs> yes. The very first night, we stayed with some friends in Ohio, in Cincinnati, and that next morning, we found out that our iPad cab power cable had been chewed through by their cat. It was. Oh wow! It was depressing. And there was a small black scorch mark in the middle of the floor where the cat had been. Best movie ever. <laughs> Best movie ever. <laughs> yes, I know. I get it. You want attention. Speaking of food, I still, and that tour reminds me of uh, introducing you to Los Portales in Omaha Ed, when you came by so yummy. on the tour. Uh, that amazing Mexican restaurant that was down the street from our place there. Gosh, I recall liking it, but not loving it. I, I, it was the pastor. I was just in love with the pastor. They'd make it at two in the morning. So if you'd be coming back from the bars, which were not too far away, you could basically stumble into Los Portales at like 2.15 and you get all this fresh pastor that had just been cut up. Uh, uh, oh, it was so good. Is the thing I miss the most about Omaha, uh, is that one little Mexican restaurant. Amazing. But I know you're Southern California and you're snob. I'm Mexican. spoiled for Mexican food. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> spoiled for Mexican. Food. Dylan, why don't you tell us about your T-shirts? Uh, tabletop. Yeah, I do uh, board game themed T-shirts. None of them are like official, you know, you won't find like a Catan t-shirt or like any specific IP, but they're mainly geared towards um, hobbyists like us who are fans of the genre. And it ranges from like RPG stuff, like D&D &D type of uh, designs or some more specific things. Like one of the, one of the first um, product lines was different type of gamers, like Euro gamers or omni gamers so all the different ways that you can kind of categorize yourself and express yourself as a different uh, type of gamer but well, yeah, we so actually had our yeah go ahead go right ahead i was i was thinking about it's this thing non-licensed you say underground right then you get that <laughs> right. thing. i think the thing that street I'm, cred that way things i always say is like there's there's like a few a few outlets that make like board game related merchandise but i feel like it's nice that dylan's bringing like kind of a design eye to it because these are like really really slick nicely designed 
shirts with like amazing uh, artwork on them. And so they're not sort of the like cash grabby stuff you see at conventions sometimes yeah. where someone's like thrown up a bunch of like random clip arty stuff that's meant to just appeal to board gamers. I think it's really fun to like see Dylan exploring like all these different things and bringing like a really good graphic design eye to it. So I know there have been a lot of like influencers and stuff. I've seen a lot of photos on Twitter and stuff lately of folks wearing your shirts. So it's pretty cool to see that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the idea was to basically have designs that were just cool-looking graphic tees um, that you, if you just looked at it, you wouldn't even necessarily know it was like related to board games. Um, but then once you got it, you're like, oh, cool. This is actually like for me, you know, as a gamer. Um, but you could wear it around town without looking like a dork, I guess. <laughs> That's the best. Is, like the crypto. You want that? You want like the secret handshake, right? You see somebody in yep. the street, they're wearing like a little maple, and you're like, "Oh, exactly. I got you." That's exactly it. That's the idea. <laughs> but yeah, the I... first uh, the first convention we did, or was at Dice Tower West, which was in February, which is literally like the last convention before the pandemic. So it was like oh, right man. right when I ramped up, got some stock, you know, got into the groove of like shipping things across the country and all that. Um, I was like, all right, well, you can you can just give that a break for the year. I mean, it, it gives me more time to analyze what I learned from that convention, but it was kind of a weird uh, ramp up and then an immediate plateau. So, did you guys go to GTS? Uh, which one is that? Oh, it's it's in Reno. It's the oh. it's more focused on retailers and stuff. But that's was... the one right afterwards, right after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a trade show. Yeah, March 13, I think it was this year, and uh, Ed and I, you know, like we we had a, we were gonna go and everything got canceled last second. Mm -hmm. um, like a bunch of meetings got canceled on Sunday before, and um, yeah, we wound up canceling what like 36 hours out or something. Yeah, yeah, really and and, and you know, and it was apparently a ghost town because in the middle of that they had the, it was announced that European travel was gonna be restricted, and so a bunch of people had come over from the UK and Europe and were like. Okay, gotta go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> ditched out immediately. It was total, total chaos. It's such a weird, it's a weird year we're in. But uh, just lay the groundwork for next year. That's what we do. Exactly. Take a little extra time. I remember not. Uh, I didn't know that Dylan made T-shirts until um, we were working on the merch mini expansion. Oh yeah. And you created that kick-ass little shirt um, on the merch tile, one of the merch tiles, and I was like, "Wow, that's awesome!" And then Sean's like, "Yeah, that's what you get when you do, you get a, a t-shirt designer working on your board game tiles." <laughs> yeah, it just so happened that there was a t-shirt that we needed for this game. I mean, that's the first time that I've had an overlap like that. So, <laughs> you're gonna have to make us all life-size versions of that, Dylan. We yeah, just a, let's do a nice little. memento. <laughs> We have the technology. <laughs> <laughs> it is six million dollars, however. Uh, <laughs> right. Come on, you can get your robots on that too, Alex. Oh, uh, okay, okay, yes, cyber. I need the robot body, like the. Maybe it looks a little like bit really, it's only just one robot, and he's taking a break. I, 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 he's a really just a total bum. He's just standing there the whole time. Good God. Uh, Are you it? using a Skype? background is that what's happening there it's a skype background yeah it's i was just like background. oh what's this one because i think i know other services offer them and and it's really weird because it looks like you're sort of phasing out because the edges of you are not entirely there <laughs> yeah it's like i'm pixelated I'm like a bad 8-bit character now uh so you ever see that show max headroom back a in the long 80s? time ago yeah Love that show. Hey, Dylan um, and Sean, do you remember the 80s? <laughs> I remember being born in the 80s. Or no, I guess that was the very end of the 80s. Yeah, wait, 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 Dylan, wait. Dylan, you Dylan's remember being born? Yeah. Dang. I mean, With like, this, I can't barely memory. remember anything before age I remember four. being dark and then it being really light. <laughs> <laughs> very cold all of a sudden. Yeah. I, 
What's this breed of downhill? I don't really remember the 80s, but I grew up in like a small town in Canada. So, I mean, the 80s was pretty much the 90s. So, I mean, I didn't get NES till like 1994. So, <laughs> <laughs> you didn't get any what? The, I didn't get the the NES, the Nintendo Entertainment System, oh, until okay. I think the Super Nintendo was already out when I got my NES. So. Oh yeah, yeah, it had been out for a couple of years. It, I thought I was behind the times because I remember I had an Atari for a long, long time. Again, like just tap the dust off my mummified corpse here for a second. But like my Atari Twenty Six Hundred was state of the art, and it's because my folks have been able to buy it at a garage sale, you know, for like twenty bucks or something. So here, have video games. That's they're all the same. And before that, I was playing Pong. You remember Pong? Yeah. Yeah, my my uncle like cracked it out for a 1970 Pong console. I'm playing on a tiny little black and white this big. <laughs> and here so. I am, ancient. I, I actually do re, like distinctly remember um, I had a, a book um, that I would uh, get out of the library um, that had code in it that you put into a computer to create a text adventure. And it was <laughs> not small amounts of code. You were doing like 25 pages of code. Okay. <laughs> so it wasn't like a video a game. A week later typing after class. typing it. What's that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mavis, what Beacon, that? Mavis Beacon's typing adventure. Yes. <laughs> oh, man. You I'm must. Saying, I am old enough to remember Mavis Beacon, here. so. <laughs> Those are always the worst video games when they when they try to make you learn something while you're playing. <laughs> Math Man. It was Pac-Man, but you ate numbers in the proper combinations. <laughs> it's terrible. It was actually terrible. The best was actually learning how to program so you could draw a picture. Like <laughs> yeah. I, I learned C plus in I don't know, sixth grade or something. It was typing in on an Apple II to, to hunt and peck so you could have it and draw a smiley face. <laughs> That took there you three was... weeks. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and, and again, speaking to age, I remember going to computer science class in high school and learning COBOL. <laughs> you know, people still work in COBOL. You Don't and your C+. Plus. <laughs> <laughs> Have any of you seen the show Halt and Catch Fire? Yes. Oh, such a good show. Really good. Really yeah. good show. Phenomenal yeah. show. Yeah. I love how that show almost completely reinvents itself every year, and it does it in this sort of um, understated way. Like, we're not, we're not going to make a big deal out of the fact that it's a different year, and suddenly we're doing a different thing. It's just sort of, and we're picking up now. <laughs> Come along, catch up. <laughs> I appreciated that a lot, yeah. It had a good vibe to it. Yeah, Great. it's a cool one. I just I like any show about like people are really passionate making something. That's what I liked about Halt and Catch Fire. Is like yeah, people are have their dark stories and all the stuff you expect from prestige TV now. But like seeing people that are like I like stories where people are, like deeply drawn into doing the thing. I don't I have no idea why, but you know like there's kind of this obsessive quest for you know whatever the thing is they're trying to imagine. And, all the risks they take. I just love that stuff. Same reason I like astronaut movies. I'm, I'm a weird guy about astronaut movies. Like anything involves somebody strapping themselves to the top of a rocket and going to space. Cause it's always about like aspiration and ingenuity and stuff like that. Uh, Halt and Fight, Catch Fire did a really, one of the things that it, it was very good at is making the viewer believe that some of the characters had a thing inside their head that they weren't able to articulate yet. And, and I don't know how much of that was direction and how much of that was scripting and how much of it was, was acting, but some combination of that, I mean, especially in that first season, you were like, okay, I, I get that this guy's got this vision um, and he's just irritated that he can't, that other people don't see it yet too. Which is how I feel. It almost feels like how um, it it seems to me like I how I imagine a lot of game designers must feel when they're almost at an idea but not quite there yet. It's the the thing that popped in my head. I was like, the difference between a prophet and a madman is that the madman is two steps ahead of everyone else. 
You know what I mean? Right. Like <laughs> if you're if you're too far out there, like your idea yeah. will fall apart and you'll just completely overshoot people. And then, you know, 10 years later, they realized the thing I was looking for the whole time. And I, certainly computers, I feel that was the case. You had these great, huge leaps that ever just completely, whoo, these folks weren't there yet. Yeah, it's interesting to, yeah. to see. Um, I just, we just watched the film Game Master. Oh, it's a okay. newish film about board game designers. Um, I think it's on, I think you can rent it on uh, Amazon Prime. But uh, yeah, it's pretty interesting to see, you know, like a full length feature documentary, you know, decent production quality about like game designers in the industry. And it's just such a, I don't know, there's been, kind of an explosion lately of, of folks d doing it and it's pretty it's pretty cool to see like the stories and I'm always like super interested in all that kind of stuff just to see behind the scenes like it'd be amazing to learn more about like some of the biggest games out today like what is what how did that kind of go through from con concept all the way through like the development process and prototyping and actually like forming like an amazing product i think there's i think there's probably like at least within the hobby there's like an appetite for like learning more about those stories and stuff and a lot of people share that kind of stuff there's designer diaries on bgg and those sorts of things but it's cool to be able to just like sit down and watch a documentary and see like see some of those stories who did they interview so scott rogers was one of the folks that was on there um Matt so, Leacock. Yeah, Matt was on that one. Um, Eric Lang was in it. Um, there's a woman who designed the arranged uh, the game about arranged marriage that was on Kickstarter not too long ago. Um, I have, it, um, name's not ringing a bell. Yeah, it was a a, a, a woman from Pakistan, and uh, so it was really cool. Um, just like showing like their different stories, um, and. That was that was a really cool game. I didn't end up backing that one, but the art style was like really amazing, and it was just like such a. You're talking about like people like honing their craft and just creating these super beautiful things. I think the game is called Arranged. I think could be I could be wrong on that, but it's um it's a super beautiful game. Um, but it was interesting to see like the trials and tribulations. I believe she was trying to get it produced uh, locally in Pakistan, and then had all kinds of issues with like customs and like games getting like ripped open and destroyed and like there was a lot of challenges in terms of getting the game out to backers and stuff like that but it's cool to see those um like those stories about you know um kickstarters and getting things getting things to people it can be quite the journey for sure and so you guys are finishing your journey right like with calco we are getting close, thanks to our friend Ed here. <laughs> so all of the uh, retailer orders, all of the people that got six copies, three copies, and two copies. Um, well, the two copies haven't been picked up yet, but uh, all the larger orders have already been picked up by UPS. So tomorrow we start working on the ones. Wow. So how many ones do you have to send? 4,200, I believe. Man. Yep. Well, congratulations on making it all the way. Yeah, we'll just have to, you know, wait and see when backers get their copy, and hopefully everything's all good, everybody's happy. I mean, we have a couple cases. Kevin picked up some cases from Ed on Friday, and we got to hang out and check out the game, and it's looking great. So it's been, it's been a journey, that's for sure. Huge <laughs> learning experience, like, but, you know, the just been a lot of people in the Seattle community that have kind of been through the process. Um, you know, Joseph and um, Justin from F Fantastic Factories were like super instrumental in helping us like understand, you know, just kind of what they had al already gone through with a pretty successful Kickstarter and dealing with a lot of backers and all that kind of stuff. So they were really helpful. And, um, you know, Victoria and Alex who did Gladius um, recently were also kind of on a similar timeline to us and they're just getting their like production copy proofs and stuff right now. So there's a few people in our group that have all been through the Kickstarter thing. And so it's been, it's been 
cool to like have a community around it because when you have a question you can just kind of reach out and and try to try to figure out the best answer <laughs> to the best of our knowledge even though none of us are really doing it professionally or anything like that but you know there's a lot of resources now like just with different fulfillment centers and the production of games is getting a little easier and um if you do your research online there's plenty of resources to help um to help understand the process but it's a ton of work there's a lot of back-end work that goes into uh fulfilling a kickstarter that's for sure and uh yeah. the fun part is like producing the game and like doing the art direction and like you know getting everybody on board and you know finishing up the development and feeling like really awesome about how the game's playing and then there's just like a ton of logistics work on the on the back back end to to just make sure that it goes successfully and that you don't run into any like hiccups or anything so fingers crossed so far so good but uh it's been it's been fun it's been a learning experience hey pat why don't you walk through the development timeline what's going to happen after 19 minutes from now or whatever when this ends yeah sure it we begins actually 20 minutes from now that in the uh, the update earlier today, uh, which I say strictly so that people who don't want to listen to me drone on uh, can jump over to that or they can look at it in posterity. Um, so um, short term, uh, tomorrow we're going to be releasing the print and play. Print and play will go out to two different groups. Um, it, it's in two different um, pa parcels that Dylan set up for me earlier today. Um, there's the base game, which is going out to everybody who's at $5 and above. And there's the, um, deluxe upgrade components, which is the, the mini expansions. And those will go out to everybody at $39 and above. Um, so, um, more than likely those are going to go out in an update, but there's still a possibility they might go out in messages. Uh, and I'm reserving the, uh, the, the right to switch gears on that at the last minute. Um, uh, but you guys should see all of that tomorrow. Uh, we're working with Pledge Manager now, and we expect that we'll be opening the Pledge Manager, our target date, which is, this is actually the first time we're announcing it, but uh, and it's not hard, but it's uh, a week from tomorrow, which is the 18th of August. Um, and uh, I think we can hit that date. We uh, had a, we have a couple of things brewing for the, pledge manager that will be surprises um like it's not just as easy as hey grab the game and uh your funds go toward this extra stretch goal we've got some other stuff that we're doing too so um we'll be announcing that closer to the day um and you'll definitely want to pay attention to the pledge manager because i think it'll actually be just as exciting as the the base game period uh, the pledge manager will close sometime in September. Right now, we're looking at the beginning of September, but it may be the middle, depending on, uh, frankly, how quickly people get their responses in, um, because there will be only a short period between uh, us closing the pledge manager and us actually going straight into manufacturing. The game's been um, uh, through pre-production and... and um, and set up for quite some time. So um, really it's just a matter of getting GameLand the final files and having them run through proofs for us. So that, that whole process is gonna be pretty quick. Um, manufacturing will begin in October uh, and we're currently estimating that Ed will receive copies in March, but um, uh, there's a lot of variables there. Um, I actually think we'll get it there before for March, but we're saying March because always be pessimistic. Um, but who knows? I've seen some nightmare stories where things get caught in customs for months on end and there's no explanation. So we always reserve that uh, that possibility just in case because there's so many things that are completely outside our control these days uh, between shipping and customs and testing and all sorts of other things. So, um, But that's currently what I expect. So, yeah. Um, am I missing anything? Is there anything that I needed to go over about the pledge manager that I didn't? I don't think so. 15 minutes. I'm looking at the update. 15 minutes. T minus 15. And all's well. Attention Kickstarter backers. 
the, <laughs> the campaign oh, you're closing in 15 minutes. That's the other thing. If you're a founder, we'll be sent asking you for uh, materials tomorrow. Right. And the turnaround on that is pretty quick. We need it within a week or so. So you can get your donut on early. Yep. That's right. You get your picture started. We've already been in touch with one backer who has two of the founders editions. Um, so I'm sure that one will be easy. So, uh, so yeah. Um, and then of course there'll be translation translated versions of the rule book that are coming through as we get those done. We're going to be dropping them into the same uh, um, downloads folder that we've been using all the way through the campaign. There's actually a link for it right now. It's the third link on the main page. Um, and that'll stay up in perpetuity so that you can um, grab your your copy of the game and uh, your copy of the rulebook in Dutch or Italian or German or whatever. Um, and what we're asking folks to do is provide us with feedback on those. So if um, you speak German and the German one hits, please let us know if maybe there's a bit of um, language there that isn't precisely accurate or the tense is wrong or whatever. I don't speak German. Um, and this is why we're asking you because I will not notice those things. Neither will Alex. I suspect neither will I, any of the people on this list on this live stream. Does anybody here speak another language fluently? I was this close on Russian and it's, I uh, graduated. So I speak French. Uh, puh. Does Klingon count? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> um, thanks to all the backers and folks that have gone on to BGG and uh, done reviews and stuff. And it's nice to see we got to our 30 ratings threshold and we're holding strong at 8.2 on oh, nice. BGG. So it's pretty cool to see. That's great. Yep. Yeah. That's like the, when you were talking about running a campaign and learning from other people, Sean, it reminded me, it's like you can't, every campaign is like its own unicorn at the same time, right? Like this one is, Every, you know, we've won this is our fourth campaign and everyone has been different right so you know the bgg thing was something we learned a lot from you know what it takes and you know what that audience expects and, and stuff like that so it's but it's been really great to see the support from folks over there i'm actually going to check it out right now yeah the, the, it's really coming along took a lot of care and feeding How are you? Um, how do you wind up marketing your shirts, Dylan? Um, well, to be frank, there's been a lot of breaks between when I'm trying to market them, like mm -hmm. like when I'm, when I've been working on this for most of the time this year. Like that's that's sort of a side hustle for me, so I'm not very consistent with that. You know, I'll I'll put something at a higher priority that you know when we have like five people on the team like we do here. Um, but usually, I, I I go for a more lower level like uh, like grassroots in, in, influencers. Yeah, just like trying to build a social media presence from the ground up. Um, mainly because I don't I don't have a lot of experience uh, marketing wise. I'm, that's definitely a fault of mine. Like I I enjoyed the creation side of things, but it's like once it's made once the thing once I've made something, I feel like I'm kind of done with it. I think that's part, that's part of the curse of the creative is you get distracted by like the new shiny idea. Yep. Um, so I'm pro I'm definitely not the one to get any advice from <laughs> marketing wise. Uh, but if I, I was mainly advice, yeah. wondering if <clears throat> so I know, so I've marketed in a few different industries now, uh, most extensively in games, but I, I um, worked in a couple others before this, and they were all radically different. Um, you know, like, uh, and some of that is just that I've been in the gaming industry so long and like, you know, the inter internet has happened since then. Um, 
So marketing in general was different back in the day. But wait, wait um, a minute, you were alive before there was internet. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was at a point, yes. <laughs> oh crap, yeah. you're old. Um, yeah, I'm ancient. Notice the gray. Um, but uh, but yeah, I was just wondering if maybe marketing shirts, like there were, there must be entirely different communities, and entirely different circles to get the word out in. Yeah, uh, I mean, this is kind of a unique circumstance because it's not, it's not just like fashion or apparel that right it's it overlaps a couple different yeah yeah it's, it's specifically like part of a of a subgenre or a subculture so so far i've been relying on that overlap um but it's kind of been nice like like at dice tower west and, and this is sort of the reason why i started doing it was there's not a lot of merch in the board gaming sphere like compared to say video gaming or like i don't know comic books or animation tv you know there's there's a, a ton of awesome you know merch you can buy in any of those um areas of entertainment but the board gaming sphere is seems like a little um lagging and obviously we, we've hit sort of a <clears throat> a growth period in the last i don't know decade or so but so this the, it grew out of me going to conventions and being like where's all like the cool swag you know like i want to i want to get a shirt to remember this convention that, that's not just like the gen con you know 2015 it just has the text and it's you know yeah it there's not a lot of attention to detail on some of those so this yeah the idea of tabletop is to kind of fill that void of uh just having some, something that's fun to look at um it's not doesn't come off as like an advertisement for a convention but it's a, a cool memento because a lot of the stuff that i buy at conventions like going to pax or um, comic-con in seattle i just try to find like the coolest piece of art that i can um and that, that's what i usually end up picking up not not like the promotional comic-con poster you know i'll just find an artist i like or someone someone smaller that i like to support um so i, I kind of view it as fitting in that that style yeah, we wind up do, doing the same thing. We, uh, one of the shows we missed out this uh, missed most this year is uh, WonderCon. My family goes to WonderCon every year, and um, we're always trolling Artist Alley and looking for like the the unique thing that uh, that we can't get anywhere else. Right. Um, uh, and it is great seeing a lot more of that stuff skewing toward us and our little corner of the universe. Um, because I mean, you expect it all to sort of like skew toward, you know, TV shows and, and cult stuff and, and, you know, anime and all that other thing, uh, that stuff, but having, having the gaming stuff is great. So, yeah. And it's just such a cool community to be part of anyways. Like I feel, I feel happy, like investing more of my time into going to conventions and having more of like a financial incentive to do th to do so because I, I just like being part of those communities you know there's a lot of advantages to the whole board gaming world that you don't get with like video games or other entertainment that that end up being so isolated yeah be, obviously the, and we, we were all so bummed that there's not not conventions this year because clearly it's like a communal you know it's something that we can all get together and enjoy as like a group it's not, it's not a solitary activity so um, and I think that's just kind of healthy, and I, I feel like that's why our, why this whole board gaming phenomenon has grown so much is like, you know, everything's going towards the internet and cell phones and social media that make you feel like you're part of a group, but you're not really like around people and experiencing that, um, the joy of like playing with other folks. So. Well, and yeah, I think the community is like you've seen people you know making the switch. I'm sure you all have done tried tabletop simulator or tabletopia mm -hmm. or something like that but it's not the same like i ran a i run a weekly board game night you know i won't play whatever but you know my group is sort of like everybody's like ah oh, it's not the same because you know the, the whole goal was to get together once a week hang out with your buddies maybe play something you know but it, nobody really cared what we did as long as we were around each other and so it's just like I don't think that, you know, no matter how good video games get or 
you know, uh, board game apps get that it will replace or even really displace um, in person events and stuff like that, you know? Right. I, I'm certainly the well. I don't. I don't want to speak for Sean and Dylan, but I, I. I suspect, based on everything I know about you two, that I am the uh, biggest introvert here. Um, I am uh, really hands off uh, with with uh, with humans in general, um, and even I miss um, going to shows and seeing people um, and sitting down and playing games. Um, uh, so yeah, it's it's. I, I think it's it's a, a natural byproduct of of having a tactile um, uh, feedback loop, a tactile and verbal feedback loop uh, with your your base hobby, right? Like you you miss when um, there is not another person in the room manipulating something in front of you. Uh, and, and having that conversation over it because that that's really what the hobby is all about right it's it, it's it, you're, you're building that that lore around a physical artifact um, that both of you can tweak in interesting ways yeah that, so. there's there's one of the things like um, so one of my one of my co-designers Rob is really like, he is a really extroverted person, but he really likes the to have a board like that board games kind of bring you around the table for like a purpose. And it's sort of like that social lubricant, like everybody has their different, you know, whether it's like alcohol for some people or whatever. But for him, it's like this game is this like common experience that we're going to we're going to have. And the conversations that shoot off from it are great. But having a central focus thing, especially like if you get anxious in social situations or things like that, like it helps like ground whatever the activity is you're doing. So it's this like way to like sort of geek out over like games but also use that as a way to kind of push yourself to like interact with other people and that sort of thing so i think it's like there's a huge amount of of that that happens and board game conventions are just a part of that right like local game or you know just game nights with your friends is just also really important and a lot of people haven't even been able to kind of interact at that level but the fact that everyone's still so engaged in this hobby and so excited about games um, is like a testament to how important that is from, for me, it's like unplugging. I don't want to, so much of our life is like necessi necessitates being connected now to the internet and connected to phones and computers and all that sort of thing. So I just want to like have a way to socialize with my friends and interact and play games. Games are great. I love game mechanics and like trying to figure out puzzles and, uh, trying to solve things and, all that sort of thing but it really you know it's it's really about doing that in an analog form that's like in physical space i just wish that you know they didn't take up so much space <laughs> <laughs> true you can have a lot know. of video games but uh board games i appreciate my wall of games <laughs> <laughs> they do take yeah. up a lot of space though but then we're it down to your basement <laughs> i'm sorry then it consumes your basement, like in my situation. It's like yeah. then you then the pandemic hits and you can't do all the math trades and stuff you wanted to do. So you can't go to the garage sales you were planning on for. So then it starts to like the blob oh. starts to take over. You just got that pile of shame and you're like, I gotta get rid of this. But where? But it's worth Don't money. get me started on garage sales. We uh, none of it well, almost none of it gaming oriented, but we have a one quarter of our garage is given over the stuff we plan to sell at our local garage sale, which was happening in March. <laughs> so it's all still sitting there. One minute uh, to go. Oh boy. And the final red seconds are counting down. Oh my gosh, this is... We, we made it. We managed it. not to sound like complete idiots or boring people. Well, mostly. I was playing bored. Yeah, for the last hour. <laughs> It has been a great campaign, gentlemen. Yes. Really good couple final days, too. Yeah. Thank everybody great. for throwing in. Having faith everybody in stepped up. Yeah, all of our backers have been fantastic. Honestly, such a civil comments section. Like, we had 
one point where somebody was uh, was maybe possibly disgruntled and it was a mistaken like misunderstanding. So yeah, it was really great. Three, two, one. And, oh, and so there we go. Fireworks. Somebody slipped one in at like three seconds to go. All right, Pat, get to work. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> Where's my PNP? <laughs> Fantastic. Can I, oh, hear I saw your there stuff? was a little funfetti during the during the countdown. That's yeah, cool. they, that always happens. It's fun stuff. Okay. Fantastic. Well, great work, guys. As somebody who got to sit as spectator and uh, <clears throat> just uh, throw peanuts from the gallery at you, uh, you did a great job. All right. Well, well, we're working with a great game and some really awesome illustrations. So, um, yeah, our job was pretty easy. <laughs> All right. As a thank you, I will not unleash my murder bots upon you. <laughs> In my I think I could outrun him. <laughs> yeah. He's he's very slow, but he's dangerous when he gets a hold of you. <laughs> Any last thoughts before we uh, kill the stream? Uh, keep your eyes on the updates. We're going to be announcing some cool stuff um, as we get close to the pledge manager. So. Yeah, I just wanted to say thanks to all the backers from myself and Molly and Rob. We're all super grateful for all your support and thanks to this team for making it happen and making it happen in such a great way. We're really excited about this game and it's come together kind of beyond what we could have ever expected. The product is just going to be so awesome so i can't wait to get it in my hands too dylan yeah i feel the same i'm excited to see how it turns out um and i'm glad you guys took a chance on me with uh i've never actually done this much illustration before i typically do like purely the graphic designs so this was a, a little bit of a step outside of my normal boundaries so um thanks yeah thanks for taking a chance and I like the way it turned out, so yeah, like, uh, it was good for everyone. Yeah. Well, and you know, I uh, I certainly appreciate uh, you guys giving us the shot too, because I know that when I corralled, I think it was Joseph Chen that pointed you to or me to you, Sean, when I was like fishing for stuff at Gamestar or whatever. So, but yeah, I, I'm glad we, you know, had that conversation for obvious reasons, and and uh, you know, you guys deciding to go with us for this one because we're really excited we've been big believers since the beginning so really excited to bring this thing out is it march yet Pat, where's my PMP? i think a lot of people are asking that question for a lot of reasons yeah. yes <laughs> <Just fast forward. laughs>